All right. That works today. Um, hope everybody's having a good morning. Uh, we are going to be finishing up John 13, and then we'll get to chapter 14. But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for another day that you've given us. We're thankful for the ability to be here. We're thankful for so many things um, on a day like this. And please help us to pay attention to your word this morning. Please help us to take what we find here and apply it to our lives to the best of our ability. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I said, and as is pretty typical of the class now, for those of you who've been in here, um, we have to finish up the previous chapter first. And so that's what we're going to do uh, this morning. But I, I really think we need to talk about this because um, there may, there could very well be some confusion here uh, based upon what Jesus uh, has said. So um, Jesus says, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I'm with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. That is a motif that we will see, excuse me, that we'll see in the next chapter as well. And then this is the part that may be a little bit difficult to, to understand. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And we look at this statement, this is a new commandment. And we say, well, what is new about that? Love one another? How is that new, right? And so think about it. Is that concept in the Old Testament, love one another? Yeah. And, we, and remember what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. Of course, hate your enemies is not in the Old Testament. And then Jesus, of course, says, love your enemies. But th he's not talking about loving enemies here. So that can't be what it is, right? That we might think that that's a, an obvious conclusion. But I don't think it is because he's talking about love, loving fellow disciples, right? So he says, love one another just as I have loved you. So what's the new part? I think the new part is you love each other on the basis of Jesus' love for you. That's the new part. And of course, what does that entail? What does that include? Well, it includes the fact that Jesus, of course, would die for his disciples. That's new. Right, you've got the, these student-pupil uh, relationships in Judaism, contemporary Judaism. So that's, again, not particularly new. But they don't die for their disciples. So I think that's the new part uh, here. And then, of course, he says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This sounds a lot easier than it really is. Why is it sometimes difficult to love fellow disciples? Forget the world. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about fellow disciples. So why is that difficult sometimes, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. I, I think it has a lot to do with expectation. Uh, we expect people in this building, but of course, it's not what the church is. We, we expect fellow um, disciples. We expect more out of them, and, and we should, but we have to remember, they are human beings. They have flaws. Maybe their flaws aren't my flaws, but they still have flaws. And so we have to remember that. Why else might it be difficult to have love for one another? Yeah, exactly. And I think in the past couple of years, this has become even more pronounced, 
right? And, and there have been situations where perhaps it's been especially difficult because you've got people maybe within the same congregation that are opposite ends of the political spectrum or uh, with regard to social issues. Well, he still says, have love for one another. I mean, do we think that there wasn't diversity among the disciples of Jesus? Well, of course there were. Uh, maybe it's, it's not as differentiated as we are, but I don't know that. They were still different from each other, right? And when you think about it, uh, and I've said this before, and this it maybe sounds a bit, a bit rude, but I don't mean it that way. But other than our commonality in, in the belief in Jesus, I mean, do we really have a lot in common? Probably not. But does that matter? Not really, because that's how important this is. And, and I think it's worth also observing that is this, I mean, would you say, well, I'll say it. Giving the very scientific um, and accurate uh, statement about how many times do you see this love each other commandment in the New Testament? It's a bunch, okay? I don't know how many it is, but it's a bunch. And, and why is that? Because they were just like us in the sense that they were weak, they had difficulties with this, and so they needed to be reminded this is a commandment. This is a distinctive feature of being a disciple of Jesus. Any, anybody have anything about that? Any, any questions or, or something they'd like to add to that? All right. Uh, one more thing in chapter 13, and then we'll get to chapter 14. So remember... We've already seen, we saw this last time, where Judas betrays Jesus. And remember I said that, okay, we aren't, um, we don't have the capability of betraying Jesus like Judas. And I think that's where this becomes a little bit uncomfortable, right? So Peter says, Lord, where are you going? Jesus says, where I'm going. You cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. He explains this a little bit. Uh, he uses very similar language in chapter 14. Um, and Peter says, why can't I go with you now? I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus said, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Here's this prediction. That Peter will deny Jesus. And the reason I said this is uncomfortable is, like I, like I said, I mean, our denial of Jesus is not going to be like Judas's, right? We, I mean, we, we don't have that opportunity just because we don't live uh, at the time of Jesus, right? But if Peter can deny Jesus, then the option is open for all of us, right? And that's the scary part is that we can find ourselves in that situation a lot of times maybe before we even realize it. Anything about that? Anybody add anything to that? Okay, All right, it's good because I'm in a bit of a hurry to get to 14 because we've got a lot to talk about here. Okay, so look at the first statement he has here. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And remember the chapter divisions are artificial. So what he's just said in 13 flows very naturally to 14. Why would he be saying, do not let your hearts be troubled at this point? Anybody know? Exactly. He's going somewhere and they can't follow him. And that's an important statement. They can't follow him. They've been following him now for you know, three and a half years, perhaps. They can't follow him anymore. And I, I, I think I mentioned this Wednesday I don't think I've paid enough attention to how difficult this would have been for the disciples. Yes, Jesus was their Lord. Yes, Jesus was their teacher. But they were also friends. They also had a special relationship with Jesus that we don't have the opportunity to have. No one's ever had that opportunity. And so he has to tell them, and he's been telling them. He's been trying to prepare them. This isn't going to last forever. 
I hate, I will die. I will go somewhere you can't go, at least yet, right? So he's getting them ready. And that explains, I think, this final discourse to the disciples is a lot, not all, but a lot of what Jesus is doing is getting them emotionally and, and um, spiritually ready for his departure. And that's serious. It shows so many things. It shows that Jesus cares for them, but it also shows a certain reality. The disciples are going to be a little bit um, um, in, in distress. There's going to be some chaos, right? Uh, and I, I think about when other very prominent uh, figures died, it leaves that movement or whatever it is. And in that chaotic situation, uh, Alexander the Great, for example, when he dies, you know, he conquers all this territory, he dies. And it is a mess after he dies. There's no clear successor, right? Uh, the same thing in Islam, uh, when Muhammad dies. Um, the, there's no, uh, the, the two main groups of, of Muslims after that, they're still around today, and there's still very strong differences. Okay, and Jesus is aware that that's a possibility here, and so he wants to get them as ready as he can. And this also explains something else that we see beginning in this chapter are these passages about the advocate. Of course, we'll talk about that. But part of his role is to help the disciples once Jesus leaves, to give them some stability and some commonality after Jesus goes where he has to go, right? Okay, so do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Some translations will say, you believe in God, believe also in me. So it changes the mood, um, or, or uh, it doesn't change the mood. It uh, translates the moods differently. Um, and you say, well, how, it, which is it? Is it you believe in God as a factual statement, or is it an imperative? Is it a command? You need to believe in God. You also need to believe in me. Uh, it could be either one. The forms in Greek are exactly the same. So you have to let the context decide. It could very well be you believe in God, you also believe in me, uh, which, would, which would supply comfort. Most translations, though, take it uh, as a command. Let's take it that way because I think that's probably more likely, especially the second clause. Why would he be telling them to believe in him? I mean... Don't they already believe in him? So why would he tell them that here? Yeah, and we could translate it that way. Absolutely. And that's something that we, I think, again, we, it's easy to miss. We, we think about belief. We think about some sort of intellectual acknowledgement or, or um, commitment intellectually that something is true. But... It has this connotation of trust, trust in me, right? Which makes complete sense in the context. All right, now I want to. We're going to take our time here because I think that this uh, this next verse in particular, there's some ambiguity there, and so I want us to try to do our best to figure out what exactly he's he's talking about. Okay, so he says, "In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places." If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Verse 2, this is the New Revised Standard Version, ends in a question. Not all translations have it as a question. Again, could be uh, either way. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. You know the way to the place where I'm going. All right, so the, the big question of verse 2 is what are these dwelling places? What is he talking about? Is this, is this heaven? And if so, why does he talk about it like that? That's, you, that's pretty unique. Um, if it's not heaven, then what is he talking about? And, and again, why does he refer to it as dwelling places? Well, I think before we can answer that question, we need to answer the question of what does it mean when he says, in my father's house? That's the first question to, to be uh, asked. Well, um, let's look at John 2, 16 through 22. This is Jesus' uh, discussion. Uh, well, it's after he cleanses the temple, right? And so it refers to my father's house in this passage. 
Now, what's a better commentary on something in John than another passage in John? And that's exactly what we have here. Okay, so he told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. All right, his disciples, remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Okay, so verse 19 signals a switch from talking about the literal temple in Jerusalem, my father's house, to his body, right? Um, the, the Jews don't understand, verse 20, verse 21, he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So here we have an equivalency of the temple, my father's house, with Jesus' body, right? When, of course, then we can make that ex extension of the body of the church, right? And they dwell, and that's an important word in John 14 and elsewhere in John, but dwelling is an important part here, okay? So disciples dwell in Jesus, which is exactly what he says later in chapter 14. All right, so the other passage in John, uh, John's gospel, which identifies what the Father's house is, it's the temple, but it also it refers to Jesus' body. Okay, so what does that mean then? Well, when we go back here, at least the possibility exists he's using temple imagery. And if you think about um, people living at that time, I mean, where would be the place that had the most rooms? or dwelling places, the temple. I mean, right, it's not like today where we have all, you know, houses and they have a ton of rooms in them. Uh, I mean, they, they had larger houses that had a few rooms, but this is probably what they would have thought about. And when you couple it within my father's house, I mean, I, I think it's, it's clear that at least on some level, there's temple imagery being used, okay? Now the second uh, phrase here. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. Uh, as many of you surely know, uh, the King James Version famously has many mansions. And this has spawned all kinds of uh, hymns and other ideas. But we'll get to that, how that came about in just a minute. But let me just go ahead and dispel that idea. It doesn't mean mansions. It does not mean mansions in the way that we think about mansions. All right? It just doesn't mean that. It's not what the word means. Um, and it's not the idea he's going for. Right? So anyway... Uh, hopefully we won't sing that song in the service because that would be a little bit awkward. Um, so anyway, uh, so all, all right, what does he mean then? Well, uh, is he talking about the future as in heaven? Could be. Is he talking about the near future in the sense of post-resurrection? This is a little bit more difficult because what this would mean is in verse 3 when Jesus says, I've gone to prepare a place uh, for you, but I will come again. It could be post-resurrection in the sense that the, the disciples are going to dwell in Jesus in a way that they've never done before. And, and that's because Jesus has accomplished his mission on the cross, cross and he has been raised since then. Right? That's a real possibility. Even though it may not be how we typically think about it, that's a possibility. Or we're in the Gospel of John. And we've already seen many times he can do two things at once, at least two things at once. So it could be both. It could be talking about Jesus' body and that the believers dwell in him. But at the same time, he could be talking about in the future um, uh, that sort of dwelling. Could be both. Uh, but let's examine which is more likely, right? Because I don't want to just leave this at, well, both are possible. Let's try to figure out which is more likely okay uh, now are there any Jewish texts that explicitly state that upon death the righteous will receive dwelling places yeah there there are uh, first Enoch for example there are many later sources by the way but first Enoch's important because it predates the New Testament or at least most of it does it's a composite work it's got different sources but a lot of first Enoch predates the New Testament why is that important well that tells us that at least some Jews believed that when you died 
you could inhabit these other places, or you were given these other places, rather, like houses. That's what 1 Enoch 91.13 says. At the close, so this is talking about some sort of eschatological timetable, and so it says, well, I guess I should ask, what's eschatology? Just to make sure uh, we're on the same page. Yeah, it's the end time, so it's, it's when the consummation of the, the world, we might say in, in Jewish thought, would be. So that's what this is talking about. So at the close of the eighth week, the righteous will receive houses on account of their righteousness, and a house shall be built for the great king in glory forever. Okay, so again, unambiguous, there are no problems here. Some Jews whoever produced First Enoch, and it was so popular in the Second Temple period, presumably there were other Jews who agreed with it, um, thought the righteous will receive houses. Okay, that's not terribly far away from what Jesus says in John 14 too. Now I left this other verse up here because it's just really, maybe it's a, it's a coincidence, but it's really interesting that in the very next chapter, just a few verses later, in 1st Enoch 92 1 he says let not your heart be troubled on account of the times for the great and holy one has appointed days for all things again I, maybe that's just a coincidence uh, but you have these two ideas together in 1st Enoch that you have in, in John 14 2 uh, again I, maybe it's just coincidence but it's worth it's worth thinking about um, because again this is a real possibility so it could be the future but what about the present? Okay, so this word that's translated dwelling place, or as I said, the King James Version, mansion, occurs only one other time in the Gospel of John. That's really important. And it's later on in John 14, 22, and 23. Okay, so Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word. And my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. The word translated home, same word as John 14, 2. What does this mean? Is this talking about heaven? They're coming to us. We're not going to them. Right. Which mean, what, is that, what does this mean then? That's right. That's exactly what it says. So what does this mean? Exactly. That's what it's talking about. They will dwell with us. So again, should we use John 14, 23 as commentary on 14, 2? Yes, we should. Now, is it entirely possible that John uses the same word in two different sentences in the same chapter? Yes, that's possible. That's what other New Testament writers do. That's what John does as well. As we'll, we, I don't know that I've pointed that out, but he's done that before. Okay, so it's not an automatic that he's definitely talking about something that happens post-resurrection necessarily. But that's, I, think, I think this makes it more likely. You can disagree. That's fine. But I think uh, this makes it a little bit more likely. It, does this make sense? Okay. Uh, does anybody, yeah? The whole context is saying, I'm not going to leave you alone. And it's hard for me to think that he's, he's saying, I'm going to come to you at the end of time. So I'm not right. going to leave you alone. Right. Uh, yeah. Almost an urgency to say, you know, I'm coming back. It, exactly. I think that's it. I think that makes, I think that makes a lot more sense. Uh, contextually, that's what we have to do. If you take John 14, 2 out of its context, yeah, it sounds like it's talking about our future reward. But contextually, I think it fits better with this idea of, of them dwelling, them, God and Jesus, uh, it's plural here, um, dwelling with us. Any, any other questions or comments about that? Yep. Yeah, and, and I think that idea of the advocate, which is what we're, we'll look at here in a little bit, I think that fits with this dwelling idea also, very, very much so. There's an urgency. He wants to give them help now, provide comfort for them right now, not something way in the future, at least from, from our perspective, way in the future, right? 
Okay, well now let's ask the question, how did this translation of many mansions get into the English, uh, our English versions? Well, if you look at uh, John 14, 2 in the Latin Vulgate, okay, uh, nothing like sun starting a Sunday morning with some Latin, right? Um, actually, uh, that sounds pretty good to me, but anyway, <laughs> that's because I'm a nerd. Um, I've got this underline. You don't have to know Latin to, to see this. Mansiones multe, many mansions. But in Latin, here's the question. In Latin, does mansiones mean these huge houses of the opulent, right? Is that what it means? No, it doesn't. It means simply a place to stay. That's all it means, a place to stay. Um, so, our New Testaments aren't written in Latin. So mansiones certainly isn't in the Greek New Testament. So what's happened here is the Latin Vulgate uses the Greek to translate it, right? So the word in Greek means dwelling places. In Latin, mansiones means dwelling places, period. It's not mansions. Okay, but the earliest English translations were based upon the Latin Vulgate, not the Greek, typically. Not the Greek. It's later. Okay, so the earliest English versions transliterate mansiones into English as mansions. I'm almost afraid to say this, but is that clear? <laughs> yeah. 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 The earliest, the very earliest translate like the Tyndale uh, English translations based on the Latin. Yeah. So the newer translations that are based on older versions of scripture or the Greek originally yeah. would have this that's where you see some of the variances because yeah. it's a more direct translation. Yeah. Uh, and um, even after gaining knowledge from what the Greek has, some translations still went with mansions because the King James Version was so influential. Uh, in fact, I, I, years ago I was reading the ESV um, introduction and they were stating that they wanted to keep some of the King James rendering because it was so influential. And people, asso a lot of people, they associate the Bible with the King James Version, period, right? That's what they think about. So I think that's had an influence too on sometimes when later translations leave in mansions. The um, ESV doesn't translate. The ESV doesn't, you're right. Uh, newer versions, it's almost like they got to the point of, well, let's keep some of what the K, uh, KJV has, but not here, because uh, it, it, it's misleading, I think. Uh, but on the, uh, yeah, let me, any, any other questions about this? Is it clear? Okay, I think I saw one, that's enough. Especially for something like this. Okay, so uh, Irenaeus. He's a writer, mid-second century, something like that. So he's a very, and this is important because he's a very early commentator on the passage. Maybe the earliest, uh, but one of the earliest for sure that we have. So he says, they say, they say here, I, should, I meant, actually meant to clarify that. They here are a group of people that he's, he uh, characterizes or he calls the presbyters. It's unclear what he means by that, okay? Um, so, so whoever it is, it's an authoritative group of people. That's about it. That's about all we can say. Um, so the presbyters say that there is the distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold, those who produce sixtyfold, and that those who produce thirtyfold. For the first will be taken up into the heavens, the second will dwell in paradise, the last will inhabit the city. And that was on this account that the Lord declared, in my Father's house are many mansions. Now what's interesting here is the English translation of Irenaeus says mansions. But notice his translation seems, to, or I'm sorry, his interpretation seems to reflect the idea of dwelling places, not mansions. He doesn't, in other words, it doesn't say those who produce a hundredfold, they got the biggest house, right? Those who produce thirtyfold, a little bit smaller, and then those who produce tenfold, 
uh, they, they're dwelling in, you know, uh, not such great houses. It's not what he says. He's talking about different dwelling places. Okay, so I think that's pretty interesting. That that seems to be how he understood it. Okay, so um, I think this explains how we got this translation. Uh, so again, just to sort of summarize, I think it, he probably is. It's more likely that he's talking about um, believers or, or God dwelling in believers. These are the dwelling places that he's talking about uh, that we can have dwelling in him, right? It's, I don't know that we need to make some such a distinction because the Gospel of John doesn't seem to make a distinction between us dwelling in him and him dwelling in us. I think it's a, it's a reciprocal kind of thing, and that's why he refers to it that way. I think that's more likely. Again, uh, this isn't to say that he's definitely not talking about uh, future dwelling places in heaven. And maybe he is, but to me it seems to be a little bit less likely. Okay, anything out, uh, about that before we move on? Yeah. Rather than revealing exactly what we need to know. Right. Okay, you, you can't handle this. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that is exactly why we don't have more detailed information about what life is going to be like beyond this one. We, we, we can't con conceive of it. So yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so now moving on. John 14, 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? I think, again, <laughs> the motif, how many times have I said this? The motif of misunderstanding. They do not understand what Jesus is saying. Um, and Jesus doesn't very often, you know, say, okay, well, here's what I'm talking about. And no, he gives them what they need. So he said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Why would Thomas need that, knowing what we know about him? Thomas needs to remember this very simple but profound truth, right? That's obvious because of what's going to happen later on. So perhaps in the way that Jesus answers him, there's a little bit of foreshadowing. So Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus has made some pretty remarkable claims in the Gospel of John. This is one of them. For him to say, no one comes through the Father except through me, is uh, what's referred to as an exclusivistic claim. What does that mean? That means this is it. This is the only possibility. And, and we think about this in particular in our pluralistic the world, our pluralistic nation. And it's controversial, of course it is. But in this context, this Jewish context, that's the preliminary competition. The, not preliminary, primary competition. It's Judaism. And he says, that's not going to work. Um, it's Jesus and Jesus alone. Okay, so what does he mean when he says the way, the truth, and the life? Well, let's talk about the last two. First, the truth here, we think, I think a lot of times when we hear the word truth, we think about it in a very um, Greek way. And that is you have, you have truth, which represents reality, and then you have everything else. And how important is that concept now? We have so many people who offer competing truth claims and it's hard to sift through it. It's, in some cases, impossible to sift through it because we don't have enough information, right? And I'm particularly talking about the, the you know, news. I mean, what's really going on? I, I don't know. And maybe I'm too skeptical about our lack of knowledge, but I, I don't know. I don't know where to go. Uh, and, and so... In that environment, it's really appealing. It's very appealing to say, well, I don't know about any of that stuff, but I know about this. Okay, Now, that is certainly, I think, a legitimate application of what he's saying. 
But I think he's saying something more, too. The truth here, I think, means surety. It means that there's a certain amount of um, concreteness to who he is. Right? The way could be really uh, characterized as the way of truth or the way of life. Right? And of course, life in uh, the Gospel of John, all, not always, but very often refers to eternal life. Okay? So that's, that one's pretty easy. We'll talk more about truth when we get to this conversation between Jesus and Pilate later on when Pilate asks the question, what is truth? Right? That is a very interesting conversation, so we'll talk more about that then. But what about the way? What does he mean there? Well, let's look at a couple of Old Testament passages because uh, perhaps many of you are aware in the Old Testament the phrase the way occurs many times. A lot of times we might think about it as way of life. It could also refer to behavior, which of course is very much uh, related to this concept of way of life. But look at Exodus 32, 7 and 8. Yahweh said to Moses, go down at once, your people. Uh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention the context. This is this uh, famous um, uh, golden calf episode in Exodus 32. Uh, so Yahweh said to Moses, go down at, at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted uh, perversely. They've been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, those are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So how would you define the way here in Exodus 32.8? They've been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. What does it mean here? Anybody know? Yep, it certainly includes that. And, and maybe primarily so. They have turned aside from what God has commanded them. And it's obvious, right? So when Jesus says, I am the way, Jesus encapsulates these commands of God in some sense, I think. All right? A, a slightly different, uh, 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 I started to say, a, a slightly different way of using way, but that sounds kind of weird. So a slightly different usage of the term way is Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. Seek Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to Yahweh that he may have mercy on them and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Okay, so verse 7, let the wicked forsake their way. What does it mean there? Yeah. Yeah, their habits, their behavior, uh, what they decide to do, right? So, let the wicked forsake the way they're living and seek God. Okay, so then he says uh, he will pardon them. Verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, we often use verses 8 to 9 to talk about the incomprehensible nature of God. And uh, we can see how that would work. But I don't know that that's what he's talking about here. When he talks about way here, he's talking about his behavior versus ours. And when it pertains to sin. Right? His way of life, we might say, which is a weird thing to say about God, but I think it works here. His way of life is different than ours. And much higher in the sense that He's so much better than we are, right? You talk about incomprehensible. That's incomprehensible how much better he is than we are, right? So we, we bring this back to when Jesus says, I am the way. And I think it encapsulates both of these ideas and maybe more. I am the, I am the source of what you choose to do on a daily basis. I am that source. I am also the source of God's commandments, which tell us how we are to live, right? I think, again, that is, that is found, uh, uh, um, that is a loaded, <laughs> it's a loaded phrase, obviously. But I think it's, it's in uh, both of those work. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Jesus um, here makes us think about what was said in John 1. No one has seen the Father at any, no one has seen God at any time. But Jesus, the Son, has explained him. So I think the idea there is you can know things about God, obviously, from the Old Testament but not in the way that Jesus reveals them. This takes up our, our level of understanding of God to, in a different way, to a different plane than before. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah, I, I think so. And here, of course, uh, contextually, if we had to define it maybe in one sentence, Jesus is the way to what? He's the way to the Father. I mean, that's, that's what 7 says. Okay, it, it includes those other ideas, but ultimately that's what he's saying. He's the way to the Father. Um, Obviously, Thomas is misunderstanding, and Jesus isn't answering his question in the sense of saying, well, when I'm talking about where I'm going, I'm talking about dying. And um, you, you don't have to do that just yet, although you may be called upon it to do. It's not what he does, right? He says, I'm the way. And like I said, I think Thomas needed to hear this. Um, does this. Does this lack of belief show up later on? It does. He, Jesus has been raised. He doesn't believe it. He does not believe it. So maybe that's exactly what he needed here. Anything else about this? Okay. Well, uh, let's look at this passage. Uh, in particular, verse 10 fits, I think, really well with the understanding of, uh, at least one understanding of the dwelling places that I mentioned a little bit earlier. I think this works well. Okay, so now Philip speaks, and he says, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And Jesus says, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I think here we see Jesus' frustration. Why on earth would Philip say this? Sometimes I... You know, you look at the disciples and you think, I can understand where they're coming from. I don't quite understand where, <laughs> where Philip is coming from here. But maybe that's just my own um, naivete. Why would Philip say this? What does he have in mind? Anybody know? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a good distinction to make, the physical and the spiritual. Perhaps they wanted something like the burning bush, or, or arguably more impressive than that, the giving of the law at Sinai. Philip says, show me that. That's what I want to see. That'll be good enough, right? Something like that. Some theophany, as it's referred to. And Jesus says, what are you, what are you talking about? And there's a really practical point here. And, it's, and I hope I'm not overreading it. But this has to do, I think, with perception versus reality. Or maybe not perception, but expectation versus reality. Philip expected and wanted God to, to show himself in a certain way. He didn't do that. He showed himself in the person of Jesus in a, in a uh, fragile human body. I say fragile because it's human. That's how God showed himself. 
And Philip says, I want something else. It doesn't really work for me, right? Well, I think this is where people get into a lot of problems with God and belief in God, and it can ultimately lead to people falling away. I'm no expert on this. Uh, you know, maybe Steve and, and the other elders, uh, or, or Josh and JP, maybe they have a much better grasp on why exactly people fall away. But I think at least in my very limited experience, um, I think it has a lot to do with expectation and reality. They expect God to do certain things or to be certain things, and He's not. They expect the people of God to be certain things and do certain things, and they don't. And when people have those realizations, they think something's not right about this. Perfect example with regard to God is why is there suffering? Now, that question presupposes our expectation is God wouldn't have suffering in the world. And there's no redemptive or just reason for it. And, it, and since there is suffering, well, either God's not just or he doesn't exist at all. And that is what some people conclude, what a lot of people conclude, right? But that's the expectation. And just because we don't understand suffering doesn't mean that we ought to have that expectation and enforce it upon God when that's not what it's about. Here, Philip wants Jesus to do something that Jesus could have done, by the way, but he chooses not to. Jesus has a certain way of revealing God, and that ought to be good enough for Philip. That ought to be good enough for us as well, right? That's a good place to end, I guess. Okay, so um, we'll pick this up on Wednesday. Thank you.